Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Mary Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Um, it says in the family afterwards in our in our um, big book, it says, uh, we do not relate intimate experiences of another person unless we are sure he would approve. <clears throat> but I might just do that anyway, since Chris opened the door. Um, I, um, it's funny that, that he did mention the phone because um, today the phone... The phone rang in, 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 in our house and, um, I heard my cell phone and I heard it ringing. I'm like, God, that's weird. I, I have a trumpet sound on my cell phone. I wired it to a trumpet sound and I really like that. And, um, I had one of my sponsees on the other phone and I said, you know, I said, I, I think that there's, so, uh, um, oh, I know. I said, I didn't hear my cell phone, um, when you called because it had a different sound. And I said, wait, come to think of it. Yesterday, Chris said he didn't like the sound of my cell phone. I bet he changed it. So we were laughing. I don't know if he did or didn't, but it was a completely different sound. And I thought, I bet that little rascal changed my cell phone ring. Um, no? no. So, um, but anyway, I was thinking about that. In relation to tonight, because I was thinking, today I laughed. And, you know, another year I would have, every instinct of the world would have been threatened. You crossed my boundaries, you did this, you did that, you know, you, I would have criticized or whatever um, that I was trained to do from a a very early age. Um, So, you know, I, I, um, I'm glad to be here and to be a part of this workshop. And we did this at the Wilson House um, last year, which was really fun and, um, so I'm, I'm honored to be here again tonight and, uh, practicing recovery principles. I, um, you know, I have to say that my first intimate relationship was with my mother and, um, growing up, I, um, it, it was, it was very confusing. And, um, at, at one point in my, in my life, my mother got in onto, uh, into a tranquilizer. So my intimate relationship with my mother was very askew. And so I never really had, um, much of a barometer for how to be in relationships. And so therefore every relationship I ever had with my alcoholism and, um, usually I was attracted to some wild people myself, um, was also a little bit askew and I would never know how to make sense of any of them. And, um, I was always trying to control them and make them work into my mold. And so I didn't really have a clue as to how to have an intimate relationship because I really, I had no tools. And, um, at any rate, hi, Carrie. Hi, Beth. Um, the one thing I could say about t- my relationship today is that I know that my higher power put me with my husband because I think we're better together two people being one, then we are separate. And um, I just have a very strong feeling that that's the case. And uh, um, Boy Meets Girl on AA campus, it's, it's, uh, it really is an interesting ride. It's, um, I think some of my favorite people in the rooms are married to other alcoholics, and uh, it's two alcoholics being married to two other alcoholics is just truly remarkable. And um, there's people in these rooms that we've called on in difficult times um, for help in our relationship. And we've also called on them, um, or, you know, they've called on us in their relationship too. And I'm like, whoa, he did that to you, you know, and whoa, you did that to him. And um, yes, we had, um, we we met early, fell in love, and um, we both had five, five about, well, at least five years, and Chris wasn't the first person I dated once I got sober. Um, my first, my first relationship in recovery was with a, um, a merchant marine, and I had fear of abandonment issues, and so every, he would leave like every four months. (laughs) He would leave, he would leave every four months for like three months or every three months for four months. And, um, what would happen to me is about a month before he would leave, I would start to get that feeling of panic. Like, Oh my God. So what I would torture him. I'm like, you, you know, 
you don't love me or you, I don't even know what I said to the guy, but it was really like three, about three weeks before he left, I would start in like finding a way to somehow make him stay. And it never worked. He was incredibly independent and he had eight years sober. And, um, I never dated anybody my first year in recovery. So any of you out there who knew in recovery, do what I did. Um, I, of course, had no choice because men wouldn't come near me. I mean, I have all their handkerchiefs, but no one thought about asking me out. I was really wild. And um, I was up, and I was down, and I was happy, and I was crying, and it was just insane. And um, no one thought to ask me out, you know? And I was, I thought, pretty eligible. So um, anyway, so I had this merchant marine person, and... um, um, everybody thought that we would get married because he came from a huge family and I came from a huge family, both Catholic. He was never married, you know, never divorced, no kids. And my mother just thought this was just the perfect little thing because they had 10 kids in their family and we had six kids and this was meant to be. And well, it wasn't meant to be. And, um, um, so that went by the wayside. And then, um, um, did I date after that? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. So I decided I decided that um, I needed a little bit of time off, and I had never really had, you know, I'm sober, and I had never really had any time just for Mary Beth. So I, so I decided, this is great. Well, I took six weeks off. It was perfect. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm just, yeah, I'm not looking. I'm not looking for any trouble or anything like that. And then I saw Chris and and that was that. And, and if any of you haven't heard my story, this is a true story. I meet you, I marry you. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't date. I don't date. I just don't, da- I don't date well. And, um, <laughs> I'm going to convince you to marry me. It works every time. So, um, actually, no, that's not always true. One guy left me at the altar with all the green shoes and everything. And, um, you know, um, the invitations and everything, that was too bad. And then I, I was married once before, and, and um, actually um, we were in court probably eight years later, and the judge was like, why are you guys still fighting about who was hitting the cab driver and who got arrested on your honeymoon? You know, and um, so I had some pretty crazy um, pretty crazy relationships, and, and I ended up going through the battered woman shelter after being married to him and in early recovery, and I highly recommend that for new women who have been battered. You know, go do it. Talk to me get it over with. And, um, that was very healing. So, um, you know, you guys, I'm 34, then I'm 35, then I'm 36. I mean, you would think at some point that there, I would have learned something about relationships. I I never did. And, um, it's not that I'm blaming my family. I'm not, I just, I was not present. You know, my whole life, I lived in a fantasy world and I can draw pictures of it. And I did want to buy a town and I saw another town for sale out in California about two years ago. And I, my heart stopped. (laughs) It did because I thought someone's going to buy that. And they did, you know? (laughs) So, um, my first husband leaving was probably, he was probably pretty smart. So, um, Anyway, so I'm, so I meet, so I, so I get, so I'm in a new relationship in recovery and it's la la land the first year and, you know, it's, you know, it's one of those perfect little, you know, first year stories and, and, um, we decide to get married and, or I put the pressure on, I think after two years or something like that, you know, it's like time. And, um, so we get married and, I think that the day after the wedding that, you know, you are, you two are just you, nobody else. We couldn't do a, we decided not to do a honeymoon the first year because it was way too stressful to have a wedding and buy a house and have a honeymoon. So we decided to wait a year. I don't know whose idea that was because I would never think of something like that. You know, my fantasy is, you know, you go on for a honeymoon for six months. So... Chris doesn't know who he married. He just doesn't know. And I've hit it very well. So the day after the, the day after the wedding, (laughs) I'm thinking that you're together. That's just the two of you. Nobody, you know, you don't see people or this and that. And I think that that's perfectly normal. And Chris is like, well, I got to go over to my mom's. And I'm like, so after a while, I'm starting to get, (laughs) now I have fear of abandonment. You have to realize because I meet you, I marry you and you leave me. So, so, um, I'm like on the phone with my sister and the phone is a big issue in our house. And, and, um, I'll tell you why it is because I like the phone and Chris likes his CDs. So I like to spend my money on the phone and he likes to spend it on CDs. So, you know, there's only one way to resolve that. You both, you go into debt. So, um, 
I could never get that because I in the psych when I was in the psych ward right right before I got sober, they said they said Mary Beth, why are you on the phone all the time? And I'm like, I have a big family, you know. So I'm always on the phone. You want me to sponsor you because I'll answer the phone. <laughs> so anyway, um, early marriage is a big surprise. You know, it's it's just a big, huge, bloody surprise to me because I'm thinking. Really, I have a very specific idea that you garden together, you <laughs> renovate together, you make, you know, you, you, you cook out, you, um, they've already been married once before, okay? Honest to God. So, and Chris's idea is, you know, well, I'm gonna start a, I'm gonna start reading the big book by the river to somebody. And I'm like, who would do something like that? You know, this is like, we do that at night. Now today, during the day, we're going to be married and do this thing. So um, I don't know how old I was at this point, but it's a little embarrassing, but I really didn't have a clue. Now, I can say that Chris wasn't a saint either, but I, I can't share his story, unfortunately, because it's a good one. <laughs> um, so, so as far as practicing any recovery principles, I had yet to write a sex ideal because we didn't do that. Where I got sober, we didn't. We just really didn't do that. We would skip big book meetings and stuff, and because we just did that, and that was that was all right for then. Um, my experience has deepened since then, which is to, you know it's beneficial. But I, I have no regrets as far as that. But um, at some point, I end up reading the big book um, with a sponsor in a, in a state of desperation, and. Um, she said, so d did you write a sex ideal? And I'm like, a sex ideal? What's a sex ideal? And he's doing big book workshops. Actually, they ended up here at this church. So, you know, they started in our backyard and it moved to this church and have been here every Tuesday night. And I resented that because who the hell did he think he was? And, um, you know, I feel less than because he's doing big book and, and who am I? You know, I'm, I'm making silk curtains and, um, not getting the attention that I think I should be getting, you know? So, um... But I'm not going to tell anybody that. You know, I was like, you know, I, I was like, wow, this is very confusing. So um, it gets to the point where I finally do the step work with someone, and that was just hugely, thank God she took me through this book, and it was very helpful, and it, it cleared up a lot of stuff for me. And um, But, you know, I was really like a newcomer many years into recovery. I was like a newcomer, and I was like, wow, there's things here I never thought of. So she goes, well, what would your ideal person be? And I thought, I cannot do this exercise because it's not Chris. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking the worst part is I know I can't be his because, you know, you all were, you all were here every night doing this big book stuff and really getting into this meeting thing and everything. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is not good. So um, I write out my sex ideal and... Um, you know, I mean, we don't have anything in common. We have, you know, he likes this, I like that. He likes this, I like that. It's it's just uh, generally there was nothing in common and um, except Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was working with others a lot. Um, what I was giving to them, I'm not sure, but I did care about people. And um, so... So I, I, I did, the good news was is that on, on, on the sex ideal, it says, you know, if I want someone with a sense of humor, which we know I already have, but as an example, if I want someone with a sense of humor, then I better have a sense of humor and lighten up. And, you know, if I want um, someone who likes to travel, then I need to, to find a way to make that palatable for them. Now, let me tell you my old way, my old way, and I swear this is the truth, that if I want you to travel, which is one of my favorite things in the world, I'm going to yell at you and yammer at you until you get on that plane, until you make those tickets, until you say, here it is, it's your anniversary gift. I'm going to make you run away from me. Because I don't know why I got that. I don't know where I, I don't know where I got that. I do know. My, I, got, I got that growing up. I, I learned that growing up. So, um, and I've, I'm very close to my parents today. I see them every day. But um, I grew up in a very, very insane household. So, um Anyway, what I found out is that I had to bring this, you know, travel happiness, right? So I'm thinking, well, all right, well, first I have to tell you our honeymoon story because it was beautiful. Um, we're we're going to go on a honeymoon a year later because that's as much as we could handle. And, and, and I, you know, I'm still confused about this marriage thing, you know. I'm like, boy, this looks different than what I thought. And... Um, 
Um, now, I don't know that, that this travel thing for Chris is, is weird. I mean, it's just untenable. It's anxiety causing. It's a lot of things that I've never met anybody who didn't like to travel because I would like, give me some booze and I'll go on a road trip and not come back. So anyway, so it's time and this limousine friend of ours is, where's limousine Rich? He's coming here and I wish he were here tonight. And, um, he's coming to get us and, um, I just, you know, I just had to put a few things in my bag, take my shower, and then I'm ready, maybe five minutes. And, um, nope, the bags have to be outside, not only by the door, they had to be outside, and I'm like, he's got to be kidding, you know? <laughs> this is our honeymoon, I mean, don't tell me to put the bags at, outside, and, um, and then it got stronger and stronger, and the message was very clear that I needed to do it now. Well, as I said to you, I've been through the battered woman shelter, and what happens to me when I'm trapped you don't want to be there. So I'm standing there and I'm like, I know that I'm supposed to stand up for who I believe in because, and I believe that Mary Beth is allowed to take a shower and she's allowed to do this. And, um, I don't know about the level of anxiety of another alcoholic who does, who traveling is weird. I just have never had that experience. So, um, I, I'm standing there and I'm going, okay, I'm trapped, I'm trapped, but I have to take my shower, I have to stand my ground, this is our honeymoon, oh no, we've got seven days of this. So there was this box cutter sitting there on my, on my dresser and I'm like, because I'm an artist, I always have this stuff around, so I'm like, I grabbed it and I held it up and I, I didn't threaten him or anything, but I held it up and I said, you need to stop. And um, <laughs> I had my second honeymoon that wasn't that much fun. And no, this it ended up being it ended up being fun after a day. But <laughs> I gotta tell you, I mean, this is I'm an alcoholic grown woman. You would think that somewhere along the line that some of this stuff wouldn't be happening to me anymore. And I had before I got sober, I had therapy every single day of the week. I had the marriage counseling, the the group therapy, which you know, being group with some people, they'll drive you crazy. And, you know, the private counseling and then the medication maintenance. And um, um, there was nothing they could do to fix me. You know, I ended up in the psych ward. And, and here I am many years later, and things are askew again, and I don't know how to stop it. So blah, blah, blah. So to practicing the principles in intimate relationship, um, whew, the only thing I could say is um, time takes time. And... Um, um, I can thank my mother today for, I would, she knows everything about my marriage. And, and I'm like, mom, now what do I do? We have nothing in common. I just wrote out my sex idea. What do I do? And she said, love him more. And I'm like, oh God, no, you know, because I think that the guy's going to leave me. I'm always thinking the guy's going to leave me. That's just built into me. They all, you know, they're going to leave or they're going to cheat on me and then leave. And so I'm thinking he's always going to leave, and my mother's going, love him more. And I'm like, oh, there's a concept. All right, I'll try that. And um, so I started to find out that that um, I have never stood in the shoes of my partner. I've never stood in the shoes of, of, the, of the man alcoholic, the merchant marine that I was dating, you know, or, or my husband. And I never stood in their shoes. I never thought, what is it that they didn't get as kids? What is it that I'm missing here? I was so worried about my own fear. And a lot of the stuff I got, can't, got through working through the steps, but um, it helped me to see, you know, what is it that I can bring that would make our marriage a safer place to be? And... Um, it wasn't that all the times were bad. It wasn't that at all. But I'm just bringing up sort of some important points. And um, um, I started to notice that things were a little bit different, you know, that um, that just bringing the travel happiness, I, I would do that. You know, I would set it up so that the vacation, like we would try to go away for a weekend just to try it. And... I would do that so that for me initially so that I could get away, you know, that we could go away. I like to go away. And um, what I found out later was I was doing something for my spouse or if you're in another kind of an intimate relationship, I was bringing something to him that he had not had before and never had a good experience with. And um, suddenly because of practicing some principles of a deeper love, I could... Um, I could maybe make my partner's life, or I'm working with a sponsee, maybe make their life um, a little bit broader, a little bit richer, a little bit of a safer, a safer place to take a step out. And um, 
also as a result of that, it, I've, I noticed a space kind of opening up um, that, that um, my spouse seemed to be able to start to open up to me a little bit, too, about some things. And um, so anyway, I, I have to say that, um, you know, recently we were talking about, you know, if one of us passes away before the other, you know, you talk about that once in a while, you know, would we ever marry again? And I, and I, um, I always thought, yes, you know, I would want my husband to get married again, you know, and I even, I even wrote a note in my, in my special locked box that, you know, somebody take care of him and, and then I took it back and ripped it up and, but, <laughs> but you know, what we found out, what we found out was, was, um, I didn't think that should be part of my will, but what, but was that, you know, if one of us passes before the other, maybe we won't ever marry again because this is enough. We are each other's other. I mean, is that like, like, that's amazing if you knew what we've been through because we have been through a lot. And, um, um, I wouldn't say we have a violent marriage or anything, but there have been times when we haven't talked for a while. And, um, one of those sessions, um, made me go to Al-Anon for a while. And I think that my, um, cause I had some things I needed to learn. Um, like I know best for you about what's good for your life and, um, that I can be a control freak. And I didn't know those things about me. I thought I was just being, um, directed. I was more, I have a very good direction for how I think you should live and think. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen West Wing and, um, where that girl goes around behind Josh and, and, and she's like, da -da 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 you know, this is Josh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And that was me. Like, you know, um, when Chris comes home, he likes the quiet time. And when, and, and, and when, when, and since I've mostly been working at home, when he comes home, I want to talk. So that's something else that I've had to, um, um, really work on. And, um, what I did recently was get a studio outside of the house and it's working much better. And, um, if any of you have ever fought in the car about the heat, do you, you guys fight about the heat? We finally got a car, honestly, that has the two heating systems. <laughs> And we've never had a fight about the heat since. So, you know, that's not a principle or anything, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's common sense and it works. Um, my old therapist used to say to me, he said, you know, you, you have a lot going on. I don't know how you do it, but you're one person who keeps fighting and you keep doing everything you possibly can to, to get better and to make things work. And, um, I was like determined that, um, that the way this marriage was going to go, it was going to work the way I wanted it to work. And no matter what, I was going to make sure that this marriage continued because, um, it's, it's not so easy to stay married when you're two very different people with two de very different um, expectations about what that should look like. And um, as I said, I came from a really big family, and when, and when we all get together, everybody's in each other's business, and we're all hanging out in the same room, and if someone moves, we move into the next room with them, and it's like this just sort of moving sea of people. And, and Chris grew up in this house where, you know, um, they both watch the Yankees. Two people will watch the Yankees on separate TVs in separate rooms. So, um, neither one of us really discussed any of this before we got married. Um, but, um, you know, one of the principles is, you know, don't crowd him, you know, and I'm like, oh boy, that sounds like one of those Mars and Venus things. You know, the man goes into his cave and you're not supposed to go in after him. And I always did because if you were with me, you belong to me. And that's just the way I thought it was. And it's not. Um, if you go into your sort of, if you go into your cave, that's your, that's your private time in there. And, and if you want to come out and talk, um, I need to leave you alone to do that. And, um, I was like, that was another thing I had to learn. I never learned anything, nothing. I learned absolutely nothing growing up. And, um, one time it was, uh, I was so confused about the way this marriage thing was supposed to work that I called up, um, Pat and Carrie and I went running over there once. Remember that? Oh my God. And I'm like, is this supposed to be like this? And, and, um, you know, I learned something. I learned that, um, my God designed me to be a certain way and my God designed my spouse, um, to be another way. And 
why would I want to change him? You know, and that was the big question. Why would I want to change him and make him like me? Um, you know, there's a, I have this new art studio, and I'm like, God, it would be really nice if you'd come over and hang out and this and that in my art studio. And then I thought, you know what? I don't want to sit and hang out and listen to his AA tapes, you know? And... Um, <laughs> But that's new thinking for me because I used to think, you know, you're supposed to be totally conjoined together and you're, there's like no separation or anything. You're just supposed to be this like glued, glued together thing. And, um, um, so it's not my place to really reform him into what I think I'm supposed to, you know, what he's supposed to be. And, um, Chris has a way of saying something. He goes, uh, we are lovable for our character defects. And if I'm ever really angry, and we do get angry, I fight, we fight. Um, I remember when I first met him and the first picture I have of him and before I ever tried to change him. You know, did you ever hear that saying, um, marry me now change? <laughs> that made perfect sense to me. And it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And... um, um But, you know, we do grow together. That's the thing. You know, if I create a safe space, um, I remember one time there was a, it was, I was going through a difficult time on something and, and he wasn't reacting the way I thought that he should react and how could he, because who taught him anything, you know, on how to react any more than anybody taught me. And uh, I remember that I wasn't going to let him be mad at me. So he would be sitting in the other room, and I would go into the other room, pick him up and bring him back and say, no, we can't, we can't be fighting, and he would go back, and I'd pick him up, and I wouldn't I? I would come and sit on him until he would come back, and I'd say, we can't fight. I don't, we can't have this unhappiness in our house. And um, it, it may sound ridiculous to other people, but I will fight to have my marriage happy. And, um, <laughs> and you know what? It worked. It worked because I believed in it, and and I I used to be so afraid to say this is the way I, this is the way it needs to be because this at least this makes sense um, that um, I would be so afraid they would leave me that I wouldn't say anything and now I'm like I will fight for what I believe in and um, I made sure that that um, um, at least for my part that we grew and. There's another thing. I, a lot of people, they pray together in recovery and in church and stuff like that. And um, I had this image that I grew up, I was forced to have, you know, I was. I grew up in public prayer was like a, a normal part of me growing up. But it was always uncomfortable for me because, um, I don't know. I remember when John F. Kennedy died, we came home from school and it was such hysteria that my mother made us all pray at the top of the stairs before we even got any food or anything like that. We had to like pray and I... I remember thinking, God, just let me get a cigarette or something. But um, no, I was a little kid. But I, so I had like I had all this forced, you know, I had to be forced to, to be I had to be forced to be intimate. Um, it's situations that were really uncomfortable. So anyway, so a lot of people um, in recovery pray together, and it's so beautiful. And they pray with their families and their children and. Um, and I thought, oh boy, this is something, if I'm not doing them, there's something wrong with us. You know, um, we, we should be doing this, you know, and, and I, um, it's just not our thing. And it's so funny because I thought, you know, well, Chris, we should pray together. You know, I would, um, yammer about that a bit. And we should really be kneeling down and praying together all the time and praying in the morning and meditating together and, and, um, all this stuff. And then, I thought, you know, I can't keep forcing this. This is not who, if God wants him to do this with me, we'll be doing this. It'll be, it'll come easily. And, and, um, and then I thought after a while, you know, I'm not so sure I want to do that either. You know, I like my private prayer and, and I love when other people have theirs and they share about it and it's a beautiful thing. And for a while I was thinking, well, there's something broken with our recovered, recovered marriage because we're not doing that. And, and, and maybe it's not our path. So the longer I'm sober, the more I'm be- becoming accepting of what is God's will for us as opposed to maybe somebody else. And, um, um, oh, the push came to shove. We have prayed together. Um, no anger. That's one of our principles in, in the, um, family afterwards, the chapter of the wives and family afterwards. Um, you know, no anger. I'm like, whoa, there's one. Um, I always thought anger first and think later. Um, be of good temper. Be patient. 
You know, be willing to remedy my defects. Um, that was a big eye-opener for me that, um, you know, I keep saying to people, well, you need to change, well, you need to change, you know, and, um, you know, maybe this and maybe that. And I'm like, you know what, if I clean up my side of the street, things work better. And I did make a commitment as a recovering woman that I would um, continue to work on myself. And um, because I did make a commitment to my spouse, um, I have to honor that. And um, there have been times maybe for like a few weeks or something I might be of not so great humor, like, you know. And um, that's not my place to bring that home to my house, you know. I remember my mother always said, you know, before Daddy comes home, even though she'd be screaming and yelling all day long, um, she said, I always put on lipstick before he came in. And I'm like, you know, she always put on lipstick. Every, and she's, You know, she probably still does. And um, what that brings to me is that, you know, in my relationships with my clients, I can't get lazy. I don't have to be perfect, but... You know, I can't get lazy. In my relationship with my spouse, I can't. In the way I speak to the women I sponsor, you know, I can't get lazy. You know, I can't I can't be snippy. Um, you know, it's just a shift in perception and a change in my attitude that that I need to be diligent with um the way I'm out there in the world and um and it talks about that too in the um in our uh, in our in this chapter um, anyway there's another thing that comes up too for um, I always picked um, or seemed to to um, be hooked into people who were had like um, I married him or I almost married a musician once and he had like a million groupies and and um, I shared him with like a million people and then with 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 us in recovery, we share each other with a million people. And it's not just in recovery, you know, if you belong to a church or a community or whatever, you end up sharing each other. And um, and uh, sometimes that can be extremely gratifying, like it was for about five years and about six and a half. I got a little, I decided to pull, we needed to pull in a little bit. But um, um, essentially, you know, we have to be, we have to be generous and share each other. Um, but there was a time when we lived, um, on the campus of a school and, and it was just really, it was like a revolving door and it was really fun and exciting and it was the kind of house where it was set up so that he could be doing step work upstairs and I could be downstairs and it would be private and, um, um, you know, a lot of stuff was going on. We had a great chicken wing party over there. Remember that? And, um, every year we had a chicken, it was a great community and, um, at one point, I realized that we were out every night of the week um, at a meeting or had people over every night of the week. I mean, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I don't know who my sponsor was at the time. She wasn't, I do, now I remember, when she wasn't married. And no one pointed this out to me, it seems, sir. I, I, but I started to get a, a note, a, a sort of an inkling that, um, many years into our marriage that we, we weren't spending any time together. We were like together, but we weren't spending any quality time together. And, um, um, I was the kind of person who, um, in the olden days, you know, if you were a, a duck hunter, I would go and like hunt ducks. Like I would like Mary Beth didn't, didn't exist from a very early age, I always would like take on your personality. And I was a hippie once. I mean, and I did all the drugs that the hippies do. And then I was into the duck hunting and the um, plaid sofas. And I would start to decorate my house like this guy. And, and, um, and then I, and then I'm with Chris. And, and although I was big in the recovery, I started to take on honestly the identity of the spouse of a recovering alcoholic. And um, I became sort of, I stepped again out of myself, which is, you know, what can I say? I do the best I can. And um, I, I had put my, put my, what I believed a marriage should look like aside for the recovery thing. And so I started to, um, I think in a way we were kind of hiding in the sport of AA too. And it sure was fun, but um, it was time for us to sort of pull in and have our nights. And so then I called my mother and said, okay, now what do we do? You know, um, I said, I don't know what to talk about. And she, she goes, honey, just watch TV. So I thought, all right, well, we'll have a date night. 
So I called my sponsor and I said, how do I get a date night? You know, I can't even tell you. This is true. So I'm like, how do I get a date night? So she goes, well, you ask them all that wasn't going to fly because, you know, we were busy. So finally we got the date night and, um, and I said to, I said to my mother, well, what do, what do we talk about? And she goes, honey, just watch the TV because she said, uh, you know, your dad's a scientist and I'm an artist and we have nothing to talk about. So we watch TV. So I'm like, okay. Right. We, so, so, um, so we watched TV every date night. That was great. It was like a Thursday night or something. And then pretty soon we started to realize that we were having fun so that it would become like Wednesday and Thursday. And this past year was like, we got really bad. Like we stopped answering the phones and we were like, we were like, you can't call on Tuesday. You can't call on Wednesday night or Thursday night or don't call us on Sunday night and Saturday night. We go home and, and, um, we've come really full circle. And, um, I can only say that that one of the greatest principles that um that that has helped me is to um is to be able to stand in the shoes of the other person I'm in a relationship with and know where they're coming from and not to try to and and not to try to put my stuff on them and um I'm not one to um throw up boundaries you know I hear a lot of people women I work with, um, from, they throw up a lot of boundaries from fear and God knows I, I've had so much fear in my life. And, um, one of the things I always say to them is, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a relationship with another person, if you, if we're throwing up boundaries, we have a lot of fear and maybe if we trust more in God's generosity, maybe there's a different way under that fence rather than throwing up the wall and cause it just creates anger and fear. And, and the idea is to create a safe space in my in my relationships and, um, the women I sponsored, most of them tell me that they feel safe with me. And, um, um, I think that I've created a safe space at home, but at any rate, I could go on for, and tell you a lot of worse stories about, about our marriage. But, um, you know, a lot of those are private. Um, and I think that I'm just pretty much done here. I can just say that, you know, I do practice the principles of patience, kindness, tolerance, and love. Um, my husband's my best friend. Um, we hang out. We don't need to talk all the time. We love to travel. Um, <laughs> we listen to music all the time. Um, I still don't listen to AA tapes. And when it's time for me to give my talk, and I gave the same talk last year up in, um, at the Wilson house, um, I don't even keep a copy of my tapes. I'm like, Chris, where's my tape? He goes, Oh, I was just listening to it. I'm like, All right, can I have my tape? I need to probably re-listen to what I covered and blah, blah, blah. And, um, um, I don't know. I think I'm pretty much done. And, um, I do share my husband, um, because I think that's what my God wants me to do. And I, I feel that, um, he is on loan to me by God and I have to treat him right. So, um, anyway, thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.